The Tom Woods Show, episode 1082. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you thought Bernie Sanders and his ideas would just go away, boy, have you been proven wrong. Best way to fight back? Grab my free ebook, Bernie Sanders is Wrong, over at BernieIsWrong.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. We're going to talk about F.A. Hayek today. We're going to talk about him as an economist and a social philosopher and try to get the true measure of the man. There's some debate about him and his legacy and what he said and what he stood for and what his accomplishments were. We're going to try to sort all that out today with Joe Salerno, who is academic vice president of the Mises Institute. He's a professor of economics at Pace University, and he also holds the John Denson Chair in the Economics Department at Auburn University. He is the author of Money, Sound and Unsound. We'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 1082. Joe, welcome back to the show. I'm happy to be here, Tom. Let's talk about Hayek. Great. I had a bunch of listeners ask me about this, or not ask me, but there was a thread in our private group about Hayek, because I think people just want to know what should I think about Hayek. He obviously makes important contributions, but then there are other parts of Hayek that are downright maddening, and we want to know how do we assess the guy overall. So I'd like to start actually maybe with the dullest part, and yet in a way the most important, if we can say something about Hayek's specific work in economics, because nearly all his cheerleaders out there are cheering for works that are not strictly economics, works like The Road to Serfdom or his Law, Legislation, and Liberty trilogy or the Constitution of Liberty or whatever. Uh, those have some economics in them, but the, the real scientific economics that he did earlier on is not really what they're pointing to, but of course that's what he won the Nobel Prize for. So his major work tends to get eclipsed. In fact, he himself was rather surprised, and I'm not even sure especially pleased, I, I don't know, that The Road to Serfdom was what he wound up being known for when that was a book that didn't take him all that long to write, and these other works are his real contributions to his field. So as somebody who wrote the foreword to a recent edition of, of Hayek's work, Prices and Production, can you give us a bit of, to the extent that you can make it layman friendly, a bit of background about the economics of Hayek? Yes, uh, Hayek um, was very interested in business cycle theory. Uh, his first article on that came out in 1928. He had actually visited the United States early in the 1920s and already by that time saw that Fed policy was um, artificially pushing the interest rate down below what we Austrians sometimes call the natural rate, which is the rate that is determined by the voluntary savings of the public. Uh, so Hayek uh, um, thought that uh, – and also saw that American economists – uh, thought that this was a good thing because in pumping new money into the economy, they, they were doing – the Fed was pumping it in at such a rate that it was keeping prices stable. But of course, the 1920s was an era of tremendous technological improvement and capital investment and we had refrigeration coming in. We had uh, uh, mass production of, of cars. We had the radio. So prices should have been falling and they should have been falling fairly rapidly. That is what we call a growth deflation should have been occurring, which is lowering prices to consumers of goods whose costs are falling uh, in production. That wasn't happening. Hayek saw that and he said, in order to keep these prices from falling, the Fed is, is engaging in monetary inflation. It's suppressing the interest rate and that is causing entrepreneurs, in addition to this legitimate growth, to make investments that would later turn out to be um, malinvestments or bad investments. So that was the background. Um, Hayek, I mean, he really went, he was 23, 24 years old when he visited the United States. And he had this deep insight to what was going on in the U.S. economy and how it all would end eventually. But how is that insight different from what Mises had already said in, in the theory of money and credit? Well, the insight itself wasn't different. And he was um, very conversant with Mises' writings. But what he developed from that in 1928, he, he wrote a very important um, article on the paradox of saving in which he, he, he dealt in detail for the first time really with this idea that how could we have more investment if people are cutting back on their consumption to save more? 
And of course, later on, Keynes was to make a big deal about this. He, Keynes called it the paradox of thrift, and he said that the very fact of saving causes leakage out of the system, that is, money is being saved uh, and not spent on consumption goods. So uh, why should investment increase? Well, Hayek pointed out just what was happening. It wasn't that purchasing power was being lost to the system. It was simply that it was being transferred. People were buying fewer consumer goods and saving the money, but in saving the money, they wanted a return on it. So um, they were um, investing it either in stocks and bonds or through banks and other financial institutions in the capital goods industries. And, the, and so we, were ha we had more capital goods being produced, fewer consumer goods for the time being. And when these capital goods, these new factories, um, these additional raw materials, these new discoveries of natural resources, when they came online, that lowered the, made labor more productive and lowered the cost of these consumer goods so that in the future people had access to the lower price consumer goods and their standards of living rose. So Hayek um, in that case was not talking about the business cycle but just how a capitalist economy could bring about sustainable growth, sort of like we have today. I mean, look, HD television sets when they first came out in, in the 1990s were $30,000. Technological improvement brought the price down to $500. That took a tremendous amount of saving and investment but eventually the fruits were the, the lower price and higher quality HDTVs. And we could say the same thing about LASIK surgery, tablet computers, and so on. So Hayek saw saving and investment, this reduction in consumption for the time being and the transfer of, of consumption into the future. That is, people didn't not want good consumers' goods anymore, uh, as Keynes uh, um, implied. What they wanted was to change the, the temporal pattern of when they were consuming goods. They wanted more goods in the future. They were saying for their kids' tuition or, or for their retirement or for a new house. So they were postponing their consumption. And Hayek basically followed out the implications of that and showed that that was sustainable and it would, would bring about um, continuing growth in the economy. I want to say something about the accessibility of some of Hayek's works because even though people find human action to be difficult sometimes. I think it's actually less difficult than you think it's going to be, given the size of it and given the, the difficult uh, opening sections. But all the same, um, I think, I, at least I hear people saying, I'm reading human action or I read human action. I don't think I ever hear somebody saying, I'm reading the pure theory of capital or I'm reading Prices and Production by Hayek. Now, why is that? Is, is there something that's inaccessible about Hayek? I, I actually recall a and I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, and I don't know if it was Walter Block who was involved, but I heard a story that at a Liberty Fund colloquium that Milton Friedman was attending, he was talking about how opaque Hayek's economic writing was, and I think he said to Walter or somebody who was there, could you actually get anything out of prices and production? I can't make any sense of, uh, out of a word of it. Well, uh, a, couple of, a couple of points to be made on that. Um, first, prices and, and production are, is an a, a extremely compressed book. It was a series of lectures that he gave at the London School of Economics that he was invited to give um, in 1931. Uh, and so he put together the lectures, and it's compressed, and it is, more, it is uh, quite opaque. Um, and Pure Theory of Capital – was really one of the few books that was a failure. I mean, he didn't really get his point across. So those two books um, I would recommend reading later on. And you really don't even have to read, as, as Murray Rothbard pointed out, the whole pure theory of capital. The first five chapters are extremely accessible, and they give the difference between Austrian capital theory and mainstream capital theory and uh, in a very clear way. But what I do want to suggest is that people read this article that was written in German, translated into English. It's very clear, and it pretty much says most of what is in prices and production, and that's the paradox of saving. Uh, and it's, it's, an, it's article length. And when I started reading Hayek, that was one of the articles that opened my eyes. The other small book they should read, which was written um, by Hayek in 1929, I believe, was Monetary Theory in a Trade Cycle. That's also quite accessible. Um, it's really just a, it's a long article that was sort of made into a book. It is a book, though. So you have to pick and choose what you read by Hayek. Um, many of his writings in the 30s are, are not not that accessible to the layperson. Okay, now is that is that article that you just mentioned that was also a book? Is is that the same as the 
essay by him in the Ebeling collection, The Austrian Theory of the Trade Cycle, or is, are those two different things? No, those are two different things. You can find that article in the book I edited by Hayek called Prices Production and Production and Other Essays, and that's one of the other essays. Okay. Yes, it can be found there. All right. So, all right, we'll make sure, and we're going to link to all this stuff. Okay. The uh, show notes page will be tomwoods.com slash 1082. So we'll link to all this stuff. Let's get to this stuff about Hayek and the intellectuals. Oh, wait, uh, may I just say one uh, more yeah. thing? Oh, um, please do. Every, everything that Hayek wrote after he received the Nobel Prize, all his pamphlets, interviews, um, and small booklets are extremely accessible um, he, he, he was talking directly to the public, to the informed public, uh, after he received the Nobel Prize in 1974. So I recommend uh, Choice and Currency. Uh, I recommend a lot of his interviews. There's also a book of, um, called Hayek on Hayek, which is a collection of his interviews and his reminiscences. So all of those things I recommend. Okay, also good, also good. All right, I'll jot all this down too. Excellent. All right, let's, uh, let's move on to... Not to the discussion of his his essay, uh, The Intellectuals and Society, I think it's called, which is a very well-known Socialism, essay. Intellectuals and Socialism. The Intellectuals and Socialism, is that what right. it is? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get to that in a minute, because that's very well-known. There's a lot to say about that. But let's talk about, in general, the aspects of Hayek's work that are more, I hate to use the leftist word, problematic. But, in other words, the parts that are a bit challenging to us, I mean, if you read Constitution of Liberty, there are parts of it where you say, I mean, Rothbard just went nuts reading that book. There are parts of it that are very friendly towards state intervention. And even in The Road to Serfdom, which in my opinion, I think is an overrated book, I'm sorry to say, or at the very least, at the very least today, I think most of the warnings are not relevant anymore. They're mostly warnings about regimes that control the means of production, and we just don't have that anymore. That's so correct. I actually am not a huge fan of that book. But in there, there are all kinds of uh, concessions made in the spirit of, but we all admit that such and such, or certainly there's no reason that there shouldn't be some basic uh, level below which people shouldn't be allowed to sink and whatever. And we all, all reasonable people think this. It's just filled with stuff like that. So what do we, how do we deal with that? Or, or what, or just put some, some meat on those bones there. What, what exactly is Hayek saying? I mean, H Hoppe went so far as to call Hayek did he call him a democratic socialist or some kind of thing so, like that? So a social democrat, he may have called. Yeah, him. that's what. Yeah, that may have been what it was. Yeah. So what I would say is that um, Hayek definitely comes out in favor of of government intervention, especially in the um, Constitution of Liberty. And if you read Mises' review, it's very the first his review of the first two parts is very glowing. But the the, the part on policy, Mises takes a very dim view of it and says that it you know it, it is supportive of of the welfare state. In Hayek's defense, I'm not defending his position, but I'm defending maybe the reason why he did it, and this is just speculation. He wanted to be heard. Um, he he had disappeared as a, as an economist um, after Keynes died. Um, uh, you know, once Keynes passed away, Hayek had said to his wife, um, "I'm you know now that Keynes is gone, I'll, I'll be the I'm the most visible or the most prominent economist in the world." He says, but 10 days after Keynes died, everyone had forgotten about him and because Keynes became a martyr. Keynes became a prophet. So Hayek was very disappointed and uh, moved away from economics uh, because he saw the way the tides were turning against um, old-style sound economics. But anyway, to, to get to the, the constitutional, he started to work on, on, on social theory and political um, um, philosophy. And uh, I, I think he wanted a hearing. And, you know, whether we remember this or not, I mean, we don't, re we didn't live it, but the 1950s, certainly the early 50s, late 40s, there was, you know, great sympathy for socialism, if not outright ownership of the means of production, but for um, socialism of many uh, you know, consumption goods, uh, meaning things like, um, uh, you know, nationalizing specific in industries and so on. So Hayek, I, I don't think, wanted to put himself um, – sort of athwart this movement, but he, he wanted to redirect it, it, it towards back towards the free market. So I think in that sense, he was a gradualist. And I think, you know, it, it was a mistake because if you look at his stuff after 1975, he is, again, very combative. He's very pro-free enterprise. Um, you, you see very little of his support for 
uh, negative income programs that, that Friedman was supporting at the time and, 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 and things like that. Now, I do want to, at this point, say something about the uh, Intellectuals and Socialism essay, because this has become the rallying cry for a lot of different people, in which they argue that Hayek has laid out the correct way that ideas ought to be spread in society. And the version of what Hayek is saying that we get popularly runs something as follows, that if you want to have social change, you have to start with ideas. And if you want to start with ideas, you have to go right to the people who are the spreaders of the ideas, namely the intellectuals. You've got to convince them, and if they get the ideas right, that will eventually permeate society, and then things will change. And some people have really run with that and used that to justify their own personal approaches to this kind of question. But there's nothing that's obvious about that to the point where it's beyond question. In fact, it's very much open to question. And of course, this style would also be very opposed to, let's say, a more populist approach that short circuits the intellectuals and goes directly to the public and just tells them, I'm not going to write you a 40 page policy report. I'm going to tell you, you're getting ripped off by this group, this group, and this group in the government. Yes, that position was wrongly attributed to Hayek. Uh, in fact, that was the position developed in the late 70s by the uh, um, people that were involved with IHS, uh, notably Walter Grinder and uh, Richard Fink. Now, and, IHS is? Uh, the Institute for Humane Studies, which st is still, still exists and ran many student programs back in the 70s and early 80s. And I was involved, and I remember when this position was, was being formulated, and it was called the Intellectual Structure of Production. So it was a play on Hayek's material structure of production in, 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 in producing goods. And so th 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 they, what they did was to say, well, this is a pyramid of social change. So we have these experts and uh, academics coming up with new ideas, but for some reason, they're incapable of spreading them directly to the, to the, the populace, um, to the informed public. Uh, we, we need sort of a, a second and third layer. The second layer may be think tanks that write policy reports that are accessible to more people. And then, then there's a third layer that I've seen them insert, and that, and that is sort of lower-level intellectuals, the journalists, um, the uh, publicists, uh, writers of books, and, and so on, uh, and including what they call actuators or, or high-level uh, libertarian activists. So then they then um, sort of take the ideas and they make them palatable to the dumb, dumb public. I mean, that, that's how they view the public as sort of passive and not too smart. Hayek would have none of that. In fact, in Hayek's article, he argued that the intellectual class that, you know, in, in, in the middle of that pyramid was totally um, unnecessary and that experts themselves could easily spread their ideas. What he, he said, that class developed sort of as a socialist leaning class. Uh, that what they did was they, 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 they weren't particularly good in any particular area, a, a, an intellectual, but they were familiar with ideas because they were writers and speakers and so on. So what they did was to pick and choose ideas from academia that fit with their worldview, and their worldview tended to stress advanced, progressive, modern ideas. And so that's what they spoon-fed to the public. So to give you a concrete example, remember in, in, in the 1960s, the new economics of the Kennedy um, and Johnson economists, Time picked that up, the New York Times picked it up, many you know, parts of the establishment media picked that up and spoon-fed that to the public, also Galbraith's ideas. But if you look at the same time in the 1960s and 70s, Friedman was writing directly for the public, um, short-circuiting the intellectuals. So was Mises. So was Hayek. So Hayek, in fact, in the book, said, speculates about getting rid of this middle class, uh, this middle level of, of intellectuals. And what he says is one way to do that is to get rid of copyright laws. He said, why should there be a class that lives on, on the earnings from their books? He said, we should have an open discussion in society about copyright laws. In effect, he wanted to liquidate the intellectual class. So Hayek never, in that article, ever made any reference to uh, an intellectual structure of production. And uh, in fact, and David Gordon put me onto this, ideas, once they're produced, new ideas aren't scarce anymore. They don't have to be produced anymore. The expert himself or herself, the person who's come up with the idea, can communicate directly with the public. 
There is no necessity for an intellectual class. So Hayek, and Hayek says that, that there's no necessity for an intellectual class. Um, and, 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 that, and in that, he is like Mises. Rothbard once told me that um, when they were talking about starting a graduate school at Fee, um, me, and Mises would be the dean, Mises kept repeating, but we must make sure that we give um, public lectures to business people and, and to the lay public. And Rothbard never understood that until I sort of wrote an article on, on Mises uh, in which I pointed out that Mises thought that the experts, the economists who, who, who knew what they were talking about, should write not only for other economists but for the public itself, themselves. So this idea then that we should be focused on – well, let's talk about the Mises Institute then. I mean let's – might as well. You're the yes. academic vice president. Yes. How is your view of the way ideas are most effectively spread – reflected in how the Mises Institute runs its programs. And I mean, I know it's, it almost sounds like we set this up to be an infomercial for the Mises Institute, but I just thought of that, actually. No, you're absolutely right. Um, we have what's called the flat structure of production, which is uh, the people at IHS sort of look down on that. But but we have experts, economists who have, who have done research in Austrian economics, and some have done very deep research. Uh, they come to our conferences um, for students, the a Rothbard Graduate Seminar, for example, and the Mises University, and they talk directly to students. They give the results of their reading and research to the students. So we're following the Mises and the true Hayek um, a path to, to, to disseminating ideas. Let's have the experts talk directly. Okay, we, we don't invite um, intellectuals. Uh, quote unquote, meaning those people who aren't pr particularly expert in any any area, but are second what Hayek called second handers in ideas. They look at other people's ideas and then they they try to make them you know more accessible to the to the public. We feel that a good economist should be able to to um, like Mises, like Hayek, like Rothbard especially, to be able to directly communicate with with, with the public. And for the most part, we have very good um, feedback from students on uh, the way we do that. How is this related to the debate over populism as a style? Yes, well, uh, uh, there was a recent um, talk or speech given to the Mount Pelerin Society uh, by Pete Betke, who was, who was the president back in November, in which he really badly confuses populism and nationalism. He attributes the populism, you know, uh, 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 anti-immigration stance, anti-free uh, free trade stance, um, an inward-looking um, view. But populism is not an ideology in and of itself. There can be left populism. Look at Hugo Chavez and, and, and Maduro in, um, in Venezuela. Or look at the Perones. They were, they were left-wing populists. Um, and there are right-wing populists. So it's a strategy. It's a strategy that's aimed at getting rid of the entrenched uh, elites uh, that are in power. Uh, so it can also be used by libertarians. And I've written about this, and I strongly think that it should be used by libertarians. So now we come to nationalism. Nationalism is, is an ideology. However, there's two kinds of nationalism, which um, Pete Betke confuses in his talk. Um, there is what Mises called aggressive nationalism. This is where the state uh, tries to expand the, the, the nation and focuses on, on its own view of what the nation is. We're at Mises is against that. Mises talks about what he calls um, peaceful nationalism or liberal nationalism, uh, which comes about, which came about in history when the um, royal absolutism was in power. And the only way to oppose it was to get a large group of people to, to fight it. And for the most part, places like Italy and, and um, Greece and, and, and parts of Germany, uh, they were ruled by outside people from other lands, kings from other lands. So nationalism was a way of forming a liberal movement. Every, every liberal, significant liberal movement has been national. Uh, and so what Mises points out is that once you've thrown off the yoke of, of despotism, uh, at that point, then the nation grows nat naturally. But he was always in favor of national self-determination. So what he, he said was that if you have a number of nations now, um, that is different peoples, uh, with different languages in an area, and they've thrown off royal despotism, you would still have a problem. There would still be the majority oppressing the minority, even with a, a liberal constitution. So Mises was in favor of national self-determination, which meant that the smaller linguistic 
or national groups should be able at any time to um, secede from 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 the the larger majority and and form their own nations. So Mises saw two parts of the liberal program. One was domestic laissez-faire, but the second was even with that, that wasn't enough. You needed to allow um, uh, national self-determination. And that wasn't from the top, but from the bottom. People would self-identify with certain religions, certain languages, certain ancestors, and they would form a nation. Let's shift gears yet again, because there's so many aspects of Hayek to talk about. I actually want to just know, what was Hayek's overall opinion of Mises? My impression is, he had profound respect for Mises. He said uh, tremendous things about him. But he, I think he did think Mises was either mistaken about some things or his attitude wasn't quite right. So what would be his full picture of Mises if in a candid moment? Well, he did, after Mises passed away, there were a few candid moments in, in writing. Um, he, he said that Mises was a child of the Enlightenment and never broke away from that. That is, that, that Mises... Mises' position that people um, rationally choose uh, social institutions that benefit them, that is, to engage in peaceful trade and to, get, to be involved in, 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 in market exchange that leads to a price system. He said that was wrong. He said people acted as sort of, um, I don't want to say the puppets, but as the followers of, of rules and traditions and customs. And that the more success, it was sort of cultural selection, so that the more successful groups that hit, hit somehow uh, hit upon the market economy, they 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 then became those that 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 grew and that prospered, and Mises sort of opposed that. Mises believed that it was a rational choice. Now, what Hayek misunderstood about Mises was Mises wasn't saying that that every individual conceived the entire market economy in some theoretical sense. Okay, that, that's what Hayek was sort of implying about Mises. What Mises was saying is that, um, that each individual immediately saw the benefits of exchanging with other individuals and, and specializing in, in things that they were best at producing, in, in things that they had the comparative advantage. Mises called that the law of association, that everyone produce those things that were least costly to them and then traded for things that were more valuable for them. And, and, and that was natural, but it was also rational. So that all the market economy is, is as Rothbard has told us, is a network of these voluntary exchanges. Now, in the 17th and 18th century, individuals, according to Mises, certain individuals began to conceptualize how this would work. Adam Smith, the British classical economist, Bastiat, and, and so that he, he called economics uh, and, and liberalism uh, an account of the unfolding of, of, of human society, that the social order unfolded and that once we saw that happening, the, uh, the, 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 the brighter people, those that were more, you know, had a, a bent towards intellectual uh, conception, wrote books on economics. So that then did reinforce the um, market economy in the sense that then the informed public could understand the implications of what they were doing. But they didn't, in order to have a market economy, you don't have to have economists first explaining it to people, which Hayek sort of believes that, that, that there has to be, uh, you know, there, there's this sort of blind following of rules and so on. And, and, it, and it's good for, for the, for the intellectuals to, um, or, or actually for the experts, he wouldn't use intellectuals for the experts to write about this and to explain it later on. Well, Joe, after we've covered all these topics, um, and now that we're out onto Hayek and Mises, dare I ask the favor of maybe you're summarizing what you had to say um, in your article that I read all those years ago about Mises as social rationalists? Because you're hitting on that here, and it has something to do with the different ways they Hayek and Mises conceived of the problem with socialism. Because when you hear Hayek talk about it, he uses the word knowledge a lot. And then people who follow Hayek, they talk about a knowledge problem, and no planner could know everything he needs to know. And I think until you teased it out, it wasn't completely clear to everybody that Mises was saying something rather different from that. Yes, what Mises was saying was that even if you had all the knowledge that you needed, um, even if you knew all the resources, the latest state of technology, um, and 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 consumer somehow consumer preferences, or if you were a, a planner that substituted your own preferences, 
there are so many diverse goods and there's so many different ways of combining goods in a modern economy, combining uh, the, the resources to, to, to produce different quantities of different goods. It's almost an infinite number of, of, of ways of using the resources in the economy. So it's not enough to know what exists in the economy. What Mises said was that you needed an intellectual, he called it intellectual division of labor. Uh, and what he meant by that was that there has to be entrepreneurs who are speculating on what consumers will want in the future using prices. So they would speculate. So Stephen Jobs would speculate on what price he thinks that consumers would pay for um, Mac computers. Okay, they had never been produced before, um, but he had some idea of, of of the demand for them, and, and and he would speculate. And then he and other entrepreneurs would bid for the labor and the materials and ne necessary to produce all the goods in society. So out of this bidding for labor and so on, what would happen is be, there'd be a price system. Every Every single unit of every single type of resource in society and every type of labor and capital good and factory would have a price so that you could always compare the cost of what you were doing to the price of – the expected price of the product. So for Mises, calculation – was the main um, benefit of the market economy that allowed uh, uh, orderly production and production according to what consumers wanted. Knowledge was not enough, okay? No entrepreneur e ever knew everything, but even if he or she did, and uh, uh, even if a planner knew everything, they couldn't combine resources in a way that was efficient because they wouldn't know the cost. They wouldn't know what they were giving up. So if you were producing a car in, in, in a capitalist economy, you know that this new, new car that's going to be a super fast car with a battery might cost you $90,000, okay? Because you know all the, the price of all the materials that you need to combine to get this automobile. Um, so you would then compare that to what people would be willing to pay. If they'd be willing to pay $100,000, then you should produce the car because that's the best use of those resources. But a planner would never know that. The planner could produce the car. They'd have the technological knowledge, but they would never know if they were giving up things that consumers valued more. So prices and calculation, calculating your costs and, and your profits using market prices would always allow you to know if you're wasting resources by producing something that has a lower value than could have been produced. So that was Mises' point. All right. Well, with that, we'll wrap up for today, and I'm going to have a bunch of readings. We'll have uh, the, th the readings you recommended from Hayek. I'll put your essay on Mises as social rationalist up there. We'll get a lot of good stuff up at uh, tomwoods.com slash 1082. Of course, everybody should be visiting the Mises Institute at Mises, M-I-S-E-S, -E Mises.org. And in fact, if they visit Mises.org, I may never hear from them again because there's so <laughs> much there. You could easily just uh, spend the rest of your life on that website. But uh, Joe, thanks so much for your expertise on this question. Tom, it's my pleasure, and thanks for all the great questions. All right, before I let you go, everybody, I've got a website to tell you about created by a listener of this show. It's called midpacktry.com, T-R-I, midpacktry.com, and it's described this way. This is a blog for runners, swimmers, cyclists, and triathletes who finish their races somewhere in the middle of the pack. Of course, we'd all like to be the ones standing on the podium at the end of the race, but most of us are just too busy to put in the dedicated hours of training necessary to get there. Maybe we'll have time someday, but for now, we're happy pushing ourselves little by little and enjoying the journey along the way. If you're an elite athlete who's come here looking for advice to get ahead of your competition, sorry, you won't find it here. Of course, you probably aren't here at all, seeing as the name of this blog is Middle of the Pack Triathlete, midpacktri.com, so never mind. For the rest of us, come back often for beginner to intermediate tips and advice mixed with heavy doses of dry humor to make your training more palatable. So that's midpacktry.com, linking to it also at tomwoods.com slash 1082. I give nice shout outs to people who get their hosting through my link where you can also get the best price Bluehost has. So it's a win for everybody. This is one of the big bonuses I give you. Also membership in my private bloggers group where you can get help when you need it. That is a priceless benefit. Not to mention a backlink on my site, which will give you some nice SEO juice, and 24 video tutorials to get you up and running. Lots of great bonuses. How do you get them? Check them out at tomwoods.com slash publicity. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.